morning and welcome to our worship service for the last Sunday of 2023. It's good to have you all here. Happy almost New Year's Day uh, to all of you. Just before I turn things over, I just want to personally say to all of, all of you folks what a joy it's been for us to uh, have you worshiping with us since the summer. And uh, we love all of you and uh, your, our best wishes are with you with whatever happens to each and every one of you. Uh, Godspeed and God be with you. And if, if there's anything I can do for you as pastor, uh, don't hesitate to give me a call. God bless you all and thank you for being part of our worshiping community for this last six months. And now our praise singers are going to get us started. Good morning. I don't think you're going to get rid of us that quickly. <laughs> our first song this morning is Shine, Jesus, Shine.
and we'll close with one of our favorites at Sanctuary with the chorus of I Exalt Thee. <laughs> Good morning. morning. It's good to see everybody out here again today. Uh, Happy New Year's Eve and uh, and happy Bills game today. And we're we're as you can see, we've got a number of of Bills rooters here with us today, and uh, they insisted that they were going to wear their blue sweatshirts. And if I hadn't been wearing a robe, I would have too. So. uh, but it's, it's good to see all of you here today. This is a, a little bit of a bittersweet time for, for me. Um, but, you know, we're here today to celebrate. We're here today to celebrate a 65-year ministry for the John Knox folks. We're here to celebrate a seven-month ministry for our being here and worshiping with you and doing work with you. And, you know, just sharing how good that's been for us and how that's really helped our transition from selling our building and leaving our space and coming to be with you. And um, so that's, that's what today's all about. Today's about a celebration. It's bittersweet in some ways. Um, but I, I, was asked, I was asked the other day, you know, just how do you feel about this? This is, you know, you've been there, been there about four years. And I said, well, first off, four years is probably about at least twice the amount of time that the Presbytery wanted me to be at a place to be their interim. And, uh, but I will say this, and because I've got some Presbytery representatives right here, I will say this, is that don't be afraid of the four years because it took us about three years for us to get to a point where they trusted me enough and I was looking to them enough for where's God leading us and we all know what's happened in the last two, two years. And it's been, it's been the right thing for us. I think it's the right time for us in conjunction with the Presbytery. Uh, it's enabled us to do some things that in terms of continuing our own ministry that we might not have been able to do otherwise. Uh, I've also shared with a number of folks that, you know, there's an awful lot of churches that are struggling to figure out how do we fill the sanctuary. Well, one of the ways you fill a sanctuary is you bring another congregation in with you because when we showed up here and we started all worshiping together, I had so many comments from each, from a number of you on both sides of of the coin that how good it felt to be here and to be, have the sanctuary filled. And last Sunday, when we had the, we really had the sanctuary filled on Christmas Eve in the morning, that was terrific. 
So just know that you know we're here today, we're here to celebrate, and our focus today is gonna be on God's promise to us and what that means in terms of a challenge to us. It means, it's gonna mean, and I hope you'll, you'll take this away from, from where we go with this, but it's gonna be on how do we accept and trust God's promise and then how do we take action on the challenge that's before us. And one of the things that I found about God's promise is that, you know, we've all done, we've all done a lot of work in church and for church and for, for poor and for the poor people, for the ministries that we run. And one of the things that I ran into is that, <clears throat> a quote that God's presence, God's presence is not bound by the space that you're in, nor the time that you have around you. It's always happening and that the work that we've already done will endure. God's promised us that. And God's also promised, and so don't be surprised, but God's also promised that he, God will continue to call each one of us to do the work that's got to be done. And that this work will continue. It's not going to stop because you close the doors of one place down the street because there's other ways in which you can do, do ministry and that's what we'll be talking about today. We'll be talking about that it will continue no matter where we are and we're still gonna be called to do that. So as we get started today, we're gonna to start and we're gonna start with uh, something that we brought here as we came here and that is we've got a number of folks that join us each week online and so I want to make sure that they feel welcome along with us so I ask everybody to stand up turn around look at the stained glass window and wave and say hello welcome and now I want to <clears throat> invite everyone to join me in a place of worship. Please join me in the call to worship that you'll see on the screen, also printed in your bulletins. In the beginning, God began by creating the heavens and the earth. And that God, the Alpha and the Omega, is the one who was, who is, and who is to come. The God who is everlasting and the creator of the ends of the earth. This God does not grow tired or weary, nor can anyone fathom God's presence or understanding. This is the God we seek. This is the God we serve. This is the God who gives us light and life. This is you, O oh God, whom we come to worship this day. Come be with us in this place. For now, now is the time, time to worship. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is actually found in both of our hymnals. If you're looking at a gray GBC hymnal, it's number 72. If you're looking at a John Knox hymnal, it's number 56. In either case, it is to God be the glory. So I invite you to stand in body or spirit and sing with us number 72 or 56. To God be the glory.
So before I lead us in our unison invocation prayer, I want to ask everyone to look at these beautiful poinsettias up here. Um, there are about 15 of them, and I want to invite anyone in this room, if you know someone who is homebound or a neighbor or someone who's sick or anyone who would appreciate a poinsettia, please, after service today, please take one and give, give them away as part of the ministry of both of our churches. And now please join me in our unison invocation prayer written by Thomas Merton. Heavenly and gracious God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost. I will not fear, for you are forever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. We have a reading from the Hebrew prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 10 through 13. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is the word from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you. And all the trees in the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow a pine tree. Instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. Here ends the reading.
Thank you so much. Now we're going to do our Litany to God for All of Time, which was adapted from uh, Ruth Duck's Bread for the Journey. I invite you to join me as we read this responsively now. O oh God of Abraham and Sarah, you have led your people in the past. Lead us now. Grant us the courage of Ruth to leave behind the old and familiar, the courage of Noah to risk laughter and scorn, the hope of Jeremiah to invest in the future, and the unselfishness of Esther to take risks on the behalf of others. O God of Moses and Miriam, you delivered your people and led them through the wilderness, giving them food, protection, and guidance. In the words of Miriam, we praise you and will sing you who has triumphed gloriously. O God of Deborah and Gideon, you have given us leaders to bring us back when we wander from you to lead against all opposition. Give us leaders and deliverers who hear you and grant us the wisdom to follow them. From the words of your prophets, we have learned justice and mercy. Help us to stay with Isaiah. Here I am, send me. O God of James and John and Mary Magdalene, you have called us to follow Jesus. Teach us how to work together in mutual responsibility, side by side, neither tagging behind nor striving to be in front. O God of Paul and Priscilla and Aquila, who risked their lives for the sake of spreading your church, fill us with enthusiasm for your good news. Use us for the spreading of the church in the building up of its parts, in the joining together of its various congregations and in ministry to the whole world. O God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself in love for the whole world, teach us to love. Grant us the spirit of Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve. Amen. Our scripture lesson for this morning comes to us from the wisdom, one of the wisdom texts, it comes to us from Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 to 8. I'm sure most of you have heard it before, probably many times over. Everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. And a time to love and a time to hate. And a time for war and a time for peace. This is the word of the Lord for God's people and all God's people said, amen. amen. I didn't have this to start out with, but it dawned on me that some of you who have heard this before might have recognized that the text opened up here a little differently than what you remember from other texts. Uh, this one came from the Good News Bible and I uncovered it inadvertently uh, at my first interim assignment, and I used this text on the, the first day that I was there, and I elected to use the pulpit Bible, which happened to be the good news version of the Bible. And when I read it, and I hadn't sat down and looked at it, and when I read it, 
The first time that I read it to folks, it was, everything happens in this world happens at the time God chooses. And they got a different sermon that day than what I had in my text because it just opened up a whole different world for me. And, I want, and so I wanted to share that with you because that's an important piece for all of us to remember is that God is so involved in everything that's going on and God's promise for each one of us is that's what's there. But Len, now let's come up to today and where we are at right now. On October 6th, 2019, that was some 1,547 days ago. I walked into the sanctuary at 3133 West Ridge Road to lead worship for the first time. My text that day was the same one that I just read from Ecclesiastes. So then I introduced myself because the only people that had met me at that point in time were the people that were on the interim search committee. And I introduced myself and then I tried to answer this question. So, now that you got me, where are we gonna, what are we going to do together? And think about that. That opens up a lot of possibilities. But, you know, a lot of people have anxieties about, you know, there's a new pastor. The other one had been here for 25 years, 26 years. And so, what's this all about? So, and you know, what's interesting for me is that it's only now, some 1,547 days later, that we really know or really understand the answer to that. We've been through a lot together and, and we've been through lifting ourselves up and really finding out some of the things that we had done and we'd done as we've gone through this journey of 65 years. So, but one of the things that has become really clear again to me is that it took a good deal of time for us to get to this point. It wasn't something that was obvious. It wasn't something that happened automatically. It happened in bits and pieces and it happened over a period of time. So, you know, when you come into and take on an interim assignment, you know, I've found that three words are generally associated with that question of, well, what are we gonna do together? Or how are we gonna go forward? Or what are you here for? Um, those three words are change, transition, and transformation. And you know, the words change, transition, and transformation, while they were probably right for what happened over that period of time, the rest of the journey certainly took on many different turns than any of us expected. The terms COVID, and quarantine, and testing positive, uh, and ultimately what effect it had on establishing inline worship and inline meetings, all affected how we were wrestling with just what was God calling us to be? How did God want us to move forward? And that was something that we had to constantly remind ourselves up as about as we tackled some of the issues that we tackled. But we soon found out, we soon found out that what lie before us was unknown and was involved. I mean, a lot like what Thomas Merton's prayer that I used in, for the invocation today. I don't know where we're going. I don't know where this road's gonna lead, Lord, but I know you're there with me. And so that's what we kept reminding ourselves. And you know, embracing this whole thing required each one of us to trust the Ecclesiastes, <clears throat> that the writers of Ecclesiastes knew what they were saying when they said, everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses and at the time God needs to have it done. So think about that as we continue to go through this today and as we go from this place, that whatever God is gonna use us for, as long as it's something God's called us to do, it's going to happen. And when God chooses it to happen, and it's going to happen because God needs to have it done then. Because that's how God works in our lives. And you know, whether it involved decisions 
uh, around selling the church building or the property or sorting through and celebrating 65 years worth of stuff. And I got to tell you, that was probably one of the biggest challenges that we had uh, is thinking about just sorting because you had to get it down to whatever we were going to store ultimately permanently and what we didn't need or what we couldn't use. <clears throat> or determining how, to, how we were going to disperse our remaining assets or even ultimately making the decision to accept Steve's offer to share space with you all once our building was sold and while we were sort of figuring out how we were gonna be moving forward and closing this out. We found, we got answers to all those questions. All those questions. In any case, they certainly weren't the questions that we expected to have to answer when we got started on that day in October. Certainly our relocating to share your space and the incredible welcome that we received here. And the ease with which this transition helped us as we journeyed forward is just how God would have wanted it to be. And so it goes back to everything happens in this world, happens at the time God chooses and at the time God needs to have it done. And so for that, I thank not only you guys, but I also thank God because God was walking with us through this whole thing. You know, we, li we do live in a rapidly changing world and the only thing that's not changed is God's presence and the need for that presence in our lives. And in that sense, the transition certainly makes sense looking through the lens of God's promise in today's text from Ecclesiastes. Everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses. That is the promise that was made to us through the, by God through the writers of Ecclesiastes for this particular text. And the best way to navigate these type of changes that we had or changes that we might, that we or you might encounter is to look at them through what God desires, through God's will. You know, the will that we pray for each and every week. You know, when we say, your will be done, what we're really saying is, God, help us to understand what you want us to do. Give us some clarity. Help us to do that work. However, probably more often than not, uh, organizations, congregations, individuals, even committees don't believe that it needs or even wants to change. I mean, change is tough work. I mean, and it's risky. And you know, we might do something wrong and look foolish and somebody will make fun of us. Unfortunately, all organizations need to change from time to time, Needs to, need to be able to adapt. And I think we all know this, but it's, it's to make us do it, I mean, there's different people that come into different, each organization, each committee at different times. Different people then have different experiences. Different people bring different gifts. They have different ideas. God has placed them in our midst for a reason. And we constantly need to be looking and moving towards a future that God is calling us to. Perhaps that's the one reason why the Bible is full of prophets like Isaiah who arrived proclaiming words like, see, I'm doing a new thing. I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. So where do we go with this? How do we find out what God wants from us? And some of this is interim work that we do. Some of it's work that you might be doing with your pastor on a regular basis and looking at who we are. You know, we're called to love our neighbor, to treat our neighbor as we want to be treated. So who's our neighbor? How does our neighbor see us? Does our neighbor see us in the way we expect that our neighbor sees us? But most important, we've got to be talking about who and what is God calling us to be and do? Not who do we think we best want to be, but who is God calling us to be? 
I think these are the kinds of questions that each one of us need to confront as we journey forward, as we do the work that we, hear, we heard in, the, in, our, <clears throat> in my setup, in my, in, in my theming, is that our work is never done. God's recognized it. The work that we've done is, is good. We've got to keep going. We're going to be called. So how do we keep doing this? And I think it's all about promise and challenge. It's about understanding or trusting the promise, and it's about accepting the challenge. Understanding the promise. You know, we're told over and over that God has a plan for us. In Jeremiah, we were told that God has a plan for us for our benefit and not for our harm. And anybody that's, that's worked with me over time in a church has heard that over and over and over again because it's something, whenever I've been struggling with something, it's something that I hang on to. And I trust that you know, someplace in there, I may not understand it right now, but God has, God has a plan. Trusting that promise and accepting what's before us. Now, God's promised presence here is not bound by space. That's part of that promise. It's there. It's big. It's bigger than any of us could know. The word, and in, and in Isaiah this morning, it said, the word from God's mouth will not return empty, but will accomplish what God desires and achieve the purpose from which it was sent. So God's guaranteeing that if we're doing God's work, it's going to happen. But we've got to trust the promise. We've got to accept the challenge. And it, the, the text goes on. And it says, you know, and all the trees in the field will clap their hands. Instead, a thorn bush will grow a pine tree, and the briars, from the briars, the myrtle will grow. And so even if it, the, it doesn't look good for you in the midst of whatever you're working on, if it's what God's calling you to do, it will happen. So to my friends from John Knox who are planning on staying here for the time being, or for all of my Greek Baptist friends that I have met and gotten to know over the last seven months, you know, these are the questions that you've got to respond to. Now, I haven't left out those, that group of John Knox folks who have, have pretty much made their minds up in terms of what they're going to do for any number of reasons. And these are still the questions that you've got to go to wherever you end up with, wherever your journey takes you, these are the questions that you've got to be asking yourself. How do I trust that promise in my life, in what's going on, and how do I accept the challenge? You know, accepting the challenge, accepting the challenge that the work that we've already done will endure, and that's good. And for those of us who just spent 60, looking at 65 years of our history, we want to make sure that that endures. We want that to be our legacy. And I've heard that language from all of you, that our names will continue to be called. And even if you think you're going to back off and, and end up being in the corner or a fly on the wall, that's not going to happen. God knows where you are. And all this will happen at the time God chooses. So. How do we make this happen? How do, we have, how do we make this happen with us? First, we need to remember that we don't make it happen. We do not make it happen. God has promised to and will work through us. And we just have to say, and this is the scary piece, we just have to say yes to whenever God calls our name. We have to take lessons the lessons that Jesus taught the disciples in terms of the work that we might have to do. We have to be prepared, be prepared for rejection. And if we get that, to shake the dust off our feet and move on. We have to be prepared to continue the fight and to know that each and every day the fight will go on. It's not going to go away. We have to be tireless and we have to be persistent in the work that we do. We can't lose hope. We don't know what God's time frame is in all of this. And we've got to remember the good news here is being prepared to treat your neighbor and your enemy as you would like to be treated, not as the way you're treated. 
we've got to be prepared to, to forgive 70 times 7 for the same infraction. We have to give up that need to finish first, to be best, to be fastest, in spite of what's going on in our culture. And we have to remember that whole message of taking the least important seat at the table. And I've got to tell you, I've had a couple of opportunities to take what I considered to be the least important seat at the table in a, in a room where I was in with strangers. And I've got to tell you, it really feels good when you get asked to move up. Just know that. So don't hesitate to take that least important seat. Yes, this may be the time that God has decided that a transformation needs to take place in your life. Perhaps this is why we've all been placed here together to spend seven months in doing, some, doing a lot of things together and doing more and more things together. So as you take the time to assess your strengths, your weaknesses, to refocus your sense of identity and mission and God's call on you, new understandings of your past, wherever you are, and directions for your future will emerge. They may be subtle, they may be blatant. God comes quietly, God comes in with a, with a two by four if, if it's necessary. And one of the keys to this is being patient, of not feeling any urgency to move any more quickly than God wants us to move. And this is where an understanding of the wisdom that's been articulated by these writers of Ecclesiastes when they said, there is a time to embrace and a time to change. And this, I suspect, we may be being led to one of those times. So if you're uncertain about this, go back to Thomas Merton's prayer, and you've got it, because it's in your, it's in your bulletin today. But just know that Thomas Merton is saying, God, I don't know where I'm going. And I don't see where that road ahead of me is, and I certainly don't know where it's going to end. Nor do I really know myself, and I think this was a powerful piece. The fact that I actually think I'm following your will, I probably am not. So maybe I should be talking to you more and getting more clarity about what you want. But I do have a desire to please you, and so God's not going to be angry with you if you're honest in, in looking for that. So. And then he ends with wrapping it all up and saying, because of all of this, because I trust your promise, God. I know you'll never leave me to face my perils alone. If you need any further clarity, I'm going to share another alternative. Some of you may have heard of it. I certainly know that my John Knox friends have heard it because I've used it before. But it's called a radical prayer. And it came to me and I'm going to pass it on to you. It came to me with a warning. Don't ever use this prayer unless you really want it to happen because it's guaranteed to be answered. Don't ever use this prayer unless you really want it to happen because it's guaranteed to be answered. And it goes like this. Holy Spirit, if this is right for me, let it become more firmly rooted and established in my life. And if it's wrong for me, let it become less important to me and let it be increasingly removed from my life. Amen. Remember, everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses, at the time God needs to have it done. And it all comes down to trusting the promise and accepting the challenge. Amen. Mm. Um, now I'd like to invite Steve to come down because I've got something I've got to share with him. Well, my brother, this has been a great seven months. And my time out here in Greece and getting to know you and working with you has been uh, has been one of the things that's made my ministry just come alive and, and work well together. But just what's happened to us here 
at Greece Baptist Church since we arrived and the welcome that we've had and how we've been embraced has, has been incredible. And, and I know as a clergy group, when I announced that we were going to put John Knox Church on the market, all of a sudden people were saying, hmm, maybe we're a, yeah, a little too big for our church. And so here you had the pastor from Messiah Lutheran and Greece Methodist and Steve and Cheryl and myself and, <clears throat> and Debs over at Trinity Episcopal talking about how can we do more together? How, what sort of a, how, what might that look like? And, you know, we said, well, one of the things we can do is we can do, we're, we're overlapping on some of our mission work and maybe there's a way for us to, to move forward there. Uh, but how else can we work together? Well, then we started doing a lot of a lot of worship services, different worship services together during special seasons of the year, and we've had more and more folks come, and we've had to have, you know, we've done one service rather than have five, and, and it's been, and, and it's just been eye-opening for all of us. And so, that was, that's just been, it's been incredible. I know my folks just can't say enough about how things have been going. Well, I got a, I got a note about, oh, about a month and a half ago, but there was a big project that was gonna come along here at Reese Baptist. Steve knows absolutely nothing about this other than he knows what the project is. <laughs> and uh, that they need to replace the roof. Well, look, look how big that roof is. <laughs> well, <clears throat> our session has uh, took up the a whole idea of how can we help you with this? And they voted unanimously to make a gift to Reese Baptist uh, of $10,000 for work on the church roof. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. And, uh, and thank you for the invite for me. Thank you for all of my folks who both are here, will be hanging around for a time, or, and we have a group of them that still haven't decided what they want to do, but you'll probably see them too. And, and I have warned them that, because I was asked once, well, what happens if I, if, what do I get if I become a member? I said, you get to be on a committee. <laughs> so, so, but uh, you know folks who are, are gonna be here, and I know you're gonna be touching base with a lot of them, and so that's, that's also our gift to you. Well, oh, thank you. Well, I, we appreciate this greatly, obviously. But it's, it's just been a joy for us to have you here. And I'm so happy that we've been able to <laughs> welcome you here. And uh, we've talked before how there's not a whole lot of differences between us in terms of our theology or our demographics or our experience in the world. Um, I, I went to a Presbyterian school, so I speak Presbyterian. Um, <laughs> so it just seemed like a good a match to, to be able to welcome you in, and we're so glad that we've been able to be a, a helpful uh, Great. part of this. So thank you. Okay, thank you. And now I want to invite you to join me in our litany of thanks and appreciation, which is in your bulletin, and it's a responsive. Uh, to you, eternal God, whom the highest heaven cannot contain, for the love and grace you promised and delivered through the years, and for the church universal, which these two congregations are a part. Amen. To our friends and neighbors, here at Greece Baptist Church who opened their arms, embraced us, and seamlessly included us in their worship, work, study, and fellowship. For all those who have gathered here in this place, who have lived and continue to live their lives for others. For those of us who will be seeking a new spiritual home, a safe and fulfilling journey for wherever that may lead, and for those of us who will remain, bless the journey that awaits them. And for the ministries that you've called us to support, and that with your help, our energy will continue today, tomorrow, and forever. 
And in all things, help us seek and willingly accept your will so that we will never face our perils alone. We ask all this with the words you used when you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now I'd like to invite Susan Orr, who's the leader of the Presbytery of the Genesee Valley, to come uh, with a few words from the Presbytery and a prayer of closure. Thank you, Alan. Good morning, everyone. I think it's really fitting that we come to this time of closure on this last day of the calendar year. Endings are strange. Sometimes they leave us unable to see beyond the sadness that we feel. And yet an ending, a closing, is also in fact an opening of a new journey, a new beginning. Tonight when the clock strikes midnight, we will rejoice in the gift of new beginnings, thanking God for the year that has been, thanking God for bringing us to a new year. May it also be so for you, members of John Knox. May you, in time, turn your sorrow over the closing of your congregation into joy over new beginnings for life and ministry in other places. Today, as we conclude this final worship service of John Knox Presbyterian Church, we rejoice and give thanks to God for the witness of this congregation for this bond that will always, always be with you. May God deepen within us the vision of hope for what is yet to come, that we may find in every change and happening not an ending, but a promise, the sign of God's new creation in ourselves and in our world. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, you have already come. His grace has brought you safe thus far, and grace will lead you home. Let us pray. God, remain with us as we let go of our cherished congregation. God, remain with us, though we will sing new songs and worship in new places. God, remain with us, though we will serve in different ways and pursue different causes. God, remain with us as we find new friends in our new congregations. God, will go with you in your new ventures of life and faith. God's peace, which passes all knowledge and understanding, will be your peace. God's love remains. God's justice will inspire. God's realm will call you to new beginnings. God is eternally for you and with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today, we've celebrated with Thanksgiving in the life and work of John Knox Presbyterian Church. It has served as a witness to God's presence for 65 years. It has served for generations the faithful people of this community. The Church of Jesus Christ will continue today, tomorrow, and forever, thanks be to God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the authority of the Presbytery of Genesee Valley, I declare the congregation of John Knox Presbyterian Church dissolved. Well done, good and faithful servants. Alleluia. Amen. I've got two quick things here, and I had forgotten them because I had left them up there. A couple of notes. Uh, one is from uh, an old 
member of John Knox, who I guess was also a member here. So there was a connection long before this. Uh, this came from uh, Jane Frank. I guess it was Jane and Bud Frank. And they just said that Bob Stevens was their pastor. Their children were baptized there. Their preschool for our youngest and our oldest. Our daughter was married there. Sad so many small churches are struggling. Our church here in Ohio is in a similar situation. Love in Christ, Jane and Bud. So that's to all of you. And many of you know them. Uh, the other it was a, a message that we got, that Sue and I got yesterday. Uh, and I think they're probably online. With, and it's my sister and brother-in-law who are in Arizona and who have joined us for several summers uh, in terms of just being part of us. There are people that started to think that they were members of John Knox. I told them I would threaten to send a pledge card to them uh, if they showed up more. Uh, but they, they just sent their best wishes. And um, so the other announcement I have is we're gonna have a closing hymn and um, in a closing benediction, but we'll ha we're gonna have a, a small, short reception out in the fellowship hall, and we've got a cake, and we're, we're gonna be celebrating together. So I'm gonna turn this over to... It's a big cake? Oh, so bring your appetite. Okay, I'll turn this over to who's ever... You don't want me to lead the singing. <laughs> okay.
And as we prepare to leave this place today, first I want to mention if any of you got a tear in your eye any time when you were singing that hymn, just remember God just might be calling you right now. But as we leave this place today, just never forget that what we are asked to do is trust the promise and accept the challenge. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels, God uphold you. With his sheep, securely fold you. God be with you till. Amen, and go in peace. to that yep. and you hang It'll on to that.